Christian Living 101 presents Simple Bible Truth, brought to you by Pastor Gene Applegate. Learn what the Bible really says. There's no church doctrine here, just God's Word. Find the secrets of a victorious daily life through Jesus Christ. We now join Christian Living 101 in progress. Why me, Lord? What have I ever done? To deserve even one of the pleasures I've known. And Lord, what did I ever do that was worthy of you for the kindness you've shown? Lord, help. Jesus, I've wasted it so, help me, Jesus, I know what I am, and now that I know that I've needed you so, help me, Jesus, my soul's in Try me, Lord, if you think there's a way I might try to repay all I've taken from you. But just maybe, Lord, I can show someone else what I've been through myself. On my way back to you And Lord help me Jesus I've wasted it so Help me Jesus I know what I am And now that I know That I've wasted so help me, Jesus, my soul's in your hands. Lord, help me, Jesus, I've wasted it so. Help me, Jesus, Lord, I know what I am. And now. I've needed you so help me Jesus my soul's in your hands now you'll remember that we've been talking about the difficult times that are coming our way and how that all the signs of the times lead us to believe that the return of the Lord Jesus Christ cannot be far off and uh, so then the question comes well pastor uh, you said uh, are we strong enough to stand and ask that question and and now the question is how do we get close enough to God how can we be sure that we're strong enough to stand and we need some help in that and so the subject of our text today is going to be drawing closer to God and I hope this will help those of you that are saying, hey, I want to be close to the Lord. I want to walk in a, a real strong position spiritually, but I need some help to find out how to do it. I hope we can help with the study today. Just before we get into the study, let's go to prayer and ask God's blessing upon it, shall we? Heavenly Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Redeemer. We know, Lord, that you are all-powerful, that you've already conquered the powers of darkness, and that through your spirit and your strength and your word, we can be strong enough to withstand the attack of the enemy against us in these trying times. 
And so now, Lord, we ask your anointing and blessing upon those who watch and listen. And we ask, Lord, that you would anoint this pastor as we give forth the word of God, that we might bring some helps to those who hunger to be closer to the Lord. We ask it in your name, Jesus the Christ, and we give you all praise for your blessing and goodness upon each of us. Amen and amen. Well, praise the Lord. Our text today is going to be found in the book of Psalms to start with. I want to mention to you that uh, when we talk about being close to the Lord, that one of the best examples that we find of a man who walked close to God is David of the Old Testament. And so I want to take you to Psalm 69. Now I think we've taken a scripture or two from that in times past in our studies. But I want to begin today with uh, uh, verse 13 and we're going to study down through 21. And we're going to catch some ideas, I trust, that will help you to uh, apply yourself into a fellowship in the Lord that will cause you to draw very near to Him. And the Bible does tell us, which we'll bring up again a little bit later, that if we draw near to God, He draws near to us. And so I want you to concentrate now upon some of the things that David went through in this psalm and uh, his response to it, and I hope it will be of help to you as we study together. And so beginning with Psalm 69, verse 13, we read these words. But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, in the acceptable time. O God, in the multitude of your mercy, hear me in the truth of your salvation. And you say, well, Pastor, now where does that come in? Well, we find that David has uh, uh, been surrounded by people that are uh, worshiping other gods. There are people that are very critical. There are people who have all kinds of ideas. Uh, social structure must have been about like it is today. And uh, had all kinds of ideas about uh, uh, who they were going to get help from, who they were going to pray to, uh, what uh, uh, alliances they were going to make with the other peoples within the area, and so forth. And uh, to sum it all up, all of them, it seemed to David, were against him and were desirous of destroying him and bringing him down from the position the Lord God had placed him in. And so he says, uh, you just need to know, Father, I'm ad living now uh, in verse 13, uh, he's saying in so many words, you just need to know, Lord, that I know all these other things are going on and people are turning to other uh, entities uh, uh, for their help. But as for me, O oh God, I'm turning to you. And uh, I want to stress now that probably the first thing that you need to do if you're looking to draw closer to God is to really analyze where you are spiritually and though we cannot uh, very well examine ourselves uh, honestly and know for sure exactly where we are spiritually, we can know what the de desires of our heart are. And I think that was the case with David. And so the first thing you need to do, I think, in your desire to draw closer to the Lord is to make a determination as to whether you're going to really call him Lord, depend upon him as Lord, identify him as the only one that you can go to for that supernatural help that only God can give. And when you come to that conclusion then, uh, like David, you need to declare it unto God and you need to say to him, Father, I know what's going on round about me and I know all the dangers and the troubles and, and I know that there are people that hate me and I know that there's not much hope out there for surviving in this ungodly evil world in which we live. Um, but Lord, with you, I can make it and I'm going to make it and I'm going to draw closer to you. And I just want you to know, O oh Lord, that as far as I'm concerned, I'm coming to you and to you only for my help because I'm smart enough to know that nothing else in this world can really sustain me and keep me from the harm and dangers that lie before us. And so making that decision, you need to declare it. Now I've had people say, well now you know pastor, I, I talk to the Lord all the time and, uh, and I really do pray all the time and, 
And uh, I, 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 well, Pastor, I, I don't really pray out loud. I just pray under my breath. Well, that's good. But by the same token, it's not good enough because it's by the confession of our words. Our words have a lot of power in them when they're spoken aloud. And when we come to this kind of prayer and uh, hunger for this kind of fellowship, uh, I'm convinced that, number one, we need to decide that we're going to declare God and our Lord Jesus Christ as the only one that we're going to come to uh, for our spiritual and our uh, natural help here as we live in this world today. And the next thing we need to do is come to the place where I'm going to confess it audibly and I'm going to declare it to you, Lord, and I know that uh, uh, you will accept and receive it because uh, it's the proper time and the proper need and I know I'm praying in your will, as we've talked about in other studies. And so we know that in the last uh, uh, phrase of uh, verse 13, we read these words, O oh God, in the multitude of your mercy, hear me in the truth of your salvation. David is saying, God, I know I'm not worthy to come before you. He doesn't go to all that explanation in this particular writing. But I'll tell you, all through the Psalms, you'll find David declaring himself to be unworthy of God's blessing. And he knows that he's walking in the mercy of and the love of Almighty God when he comes unto him. That brings up another thought that maybe isn't part of this study, but I'm going to throw it out there for you. A lot of people are afraid to get too close to God because they're afraid that they're going to bring the judgment of God down upon them. Somehow they have the idea that if I pray out loud or if I uh, pray even quietly in, in, in silence and unto the Lord that I'm going to draw attention to my condition and God's going to judge me. Well, that does not happen. When you approach God and you come to Him and you acknowledge who He is, how important He is to your life, and to acknowledge that you are not coming to Him on the basis of, of how good you are or how worthy you are or how much you know about the Scripture or all the things that you may have done for Him and serving Him down through the years, but you're coming to Him because of His love and His mercy. And David had a tendency uh, to know how to come in close to God and draw God very close unto him in personal fellowship by acknowledging his dependency upon God for help and understanding and insight and indeed spiritual growth and maturity. So we go on then to verse 14 and the next thing that we have coming from David's mouth in prayer. And I believe that he spoke it out loud and he said, Oh God, here's what he said, Deliver me out of the mire and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from those who hate me and out of the deep waters. Now David is saying, God, Lord, I'm about to drown. I'm in a situation where my feet are stuck in the mud. I can't get my head above the water. The water is rising up ever more against me. And the deep waters are coming upon me. And God, if you don't help me, I'm not going to survive. And God, you're my only hope and I depend upon you. And I count upon you. And so I cry out for your deliverance and pull my feet out of the mire that I'm stuck in. Well, you say, Pastor, I don't have any uh, trouble with the mire. You need to remember that this is speaking an uh, illustrative uh, example of how David felt. Uh, his feet were not struck in literal mire of the sea or the lake bed, but uh, he felt like that he was stuck in a situation where he could not even move his feet out of it to make any effort to escape what was coming his way. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation like that, but I have. 
And it's not a very pleasant place to be. And I want you to know, beloved, that if you ever feel like I can't move, I, I'm stuck in this situation, I can't do anything about it, and the forces of evil and darkness all around me are closing in more completely than ever before. The arrows of the enemy are starting to penetrate and my, uh, my feeling and my spirit, and, and God, I can't even move to get out of the way. God, I need some help. And that was the attitude with which David was praying. And he said, it's like I'm stuck in the mud. Now, you and I uh, probably have seen a lot of the old Western movies where uh, an animal or a man or uh, uh, some uh, vehicle that they were pulling, uh, uh, perhaps by horses or oxen, were caught in quicksand. And uh, they just continued to sink and to sink and to sink. And uh, it was almost impossible to save them and pull them out of the quicksand. Well, when you get into the muddy bottom of a, of a lake that's been around for years and the silt has settled to the bottom and you begin to walk in that, you will discover that your feet will go down deeper and deeper and deeper. And there's a suction that begins to take hold because of the water that is in the mud. And uh, uh, you cannot even lift your foot out of the miry mud to, to move. You're stuck there. And it's like uh, you were anchored there uh, to some kind of a, a iron chain that held you to the bottom of the lake. And that was the kind of spiritual and physical uh, feelings that David was experiencing as he prays this prayer to God. And as I read it and studied it and waited upon the Lord myself, uh, I came to the conclusion that this is probably a good illustration of how to express our dependence upon our Heavenly Father and our wonderful Lord and Redeemer, the coming King, Jesus the Christ. And so uh, I thought this would be a good time to talk about it. He says, Deliver me out of the mire and let me not sink. I'm going down, Lord. I can't do anything about it. I don't want to be destroyed. I don't want to be overcome by the enemy, but the forces are greater than me, and I'm going down, Lord. And so, what's the next word out of his mouth? Let me be delivered from those who hate me and out of the deep waters. Sometimes the overwhelming criticism and attacks, oftentimes from people that we thought we were close to, are overwhelming. And we come to a position where as we think about those things, uh, they just about cause us to give up, throw up our hands and say, I can't fight it anymore. It's just not, I can't go any farther. And again, I've been there and I imagine many of you have too. What do you do? Do what David did and cry out and say, Lord, you know what's going on. You know all the forces of darkness that are trying to uh, drown me in the waters of uh, uh, my failures and my problems and my, my uh, activities of, of another time. And, and, and Lord, I've got to have some help. And so he says, uh, uh, deliver me from those that hate me. They're waiting for just the opportunity to literally put me to death and destroy me and get me completely out of their life altogether. So they don't even have to think about me anymore, Lord. And, and, and these waters that are coming in, what were the waters that he talked about? Well, he, he made it pretty plain. They were the waters that had begun to overwhelm him because of his unworthiness to walk in the fellowship of Almighty God that he loves so much. And so he says, and out of the deep waters, Lord, don't let me sink any farther, farther, but Lord, it feels like the waters are up to here and I'm about ready to drown. Lord, take me out of the deep waters, uh, get my feet free, but take me out of the waters too. And Lord, you know what they're trying to heap upon me. And you know the lies and the falsehoods that they're telling. And, and you know the, the terrible anger and venom that comes out of their mouth and their activity against me. And, and so, Lord, I come to you and I, 
I need your help. I want you to come unto me, is what he's saying. And then verse 15 says, Let not the flood water overflow me, nor let the deep swallow me up, and let not the pit shut its mouth on me. Now, what's the pit? Well, the pit is the grave. And uh, uh, it's like I'm going down, I'm sinking. Uh, it's like the deep waters are overcoming me. And, and, and Lord, don't let the pit come up on top of me because if the pit closes, uh, I'm going to drown, suffocate, to be lost and, and lose my life and, and be destroyed. And without you, I cannot make it. Sometimes, beloved, you and I have a tendency to be, well, feeling like being self-sufficient or being in a position where we think, oh, I can't bother God with this. And, but this soon becomes uh, things, and uh, things become multitude of things, and pretty soon we're overcome because we try to fight our way through it in our own strength. And I want to tell you that uh, it is not uh, either humiliating, embarrassing, or a sin to be dependent upon Almighty God. We need to come to the place where we recognize that He is forever almighty and sufficient, and we are forever weak and insufficient, and without Him, we're not going to make it. And so, don't ever feel like, well, I can't bother God with this. Why not? Or feeling like, well, I can handle this myself. I mean, after all, I, I, it's not that big a deal. Well, how are you going to handle it yourself? And just how big a deal is it? And pretty soon you begin to find that it's no big deal becomes a monstrous deal. And all at once you're in deep trouble. And then you feel like, oh my, I should have been coming to the Lord before, but I didn't. And, and it's embarrassing and humiliating for me to come to the Lord now. Uh, I've got to work my way through this. No, you don't. God knows your weakness, your frailty. I mean, after all, He did make you. He didn't cause you to fall into sin that old Adam did, but He did make you, and He knew even in that time that He made you out of the dust of the earth. And so we know, as the Bible makes it so plain in numerous Scripture references, that uh, after all, uh, we are the dust of the earth, and we're going to return to the dust of the earth. And... Uh, uh, our old carnal physical body is not very eternal. So we need to prepare for that eternal one that we can have because we depended upon the Lord and walked in His statutes, do we not? Now going on, in verse 16, he says, Hear me, O Lord, for your loving kindness is good. Turn to me according to the multitude of your tender mercies. And he's saying, listen, Lord, Heavenly Father, I know how weak and frail and incapable I am. I know how my natural wisdom is so flimsy and useless that I cannot depend upon it to give me proper direction. I know, Lord, that I am just a one among millions of your people that are living on the earth this very day. But, nevertheless, I know that you have multiple loving kindness, multiple interventions, and I know that you've extended your hand to multiples of people, and I know of all of them, I may be the very least in the sight of men, but Lord, I know your love for me is just the same as it is for all the others that you love. And so he's not ashamed to admit, and he is not ashamed to call upon God's nature. God's nature is loving kindness. God's nature is to do good. God's nature is to walk in truth and power and authority. God's nature is to extend compassionate and loving helps to those who need them. As we become more enraptured, or in, I should say, wrapped up in uh, the 
uh, loving kindness of God and allow him to clothe us, to extend the helping hand, to give the word of encouragement, to uh, open our understanding to the wise decisions and, and a wise way of daily life. And as we allow him to loose his attributes upon us and within us, then we bring ourselves into a position where we can say, Lord, I know I don't have a right to come. I, I know in my own flesh that I'm very, very weak and frail. And, and uh, just that humble spirit is what I'm talking about that we need to attain in order to draw in the compassion and the love and the grace of God. If we go about with the attitude, well, I can do it myself. I don't really need any help. And sometimes, you know, God sends help to us through a fellow Christian. Sometimes he sends help to us through someone who's uh, not even a believer. And we say, no, 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 I'm okay. I'm okay. I'll take care of it. And uh, if we do that, what have we done? We've pushed aside the help that God sent us which in that same moment we pushed aside God and the Lord. And we said, I don't, no, 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 no. I know I asked for your help, but I didn't want that kind of help. Or I didn't want this way to be helpful to me. And so we need to be very, very careful to keep our spirit in humility, to keep a heart that is open and receptive to the ways of the Lord and remember that he never has to do the same thing the same way twice, and that God does move in mysterious ways, as we often say. And so it's important, I think, for us to learn how to come to God as David obviously had learned. Now let's go on. Hear me, O Lord, for your loving kindness is good. Don't hear me because of me, but hear me because your goodness, your love, your kindness is extended to me. And Lord, I'm just going to wrap myself in it. I'm going to accept it by the, by the uh, wonderful and, and marvelous gift of God that you've sent to me. And, and I'm going to be thankful for that. And I'm, I accept your help. And I know that you are a God that is centered on helping uh, those who call upon you. And, and so, Lord, uh, I want you to know that your loving kindness is good. And, and so he says in the, the second phrase of verse 16, Turn me according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Now, what's he saying? He's saying, you know, Lord, I know I've uh, followed the wrong path sometimes. And Lord, because of my uh, uh, lack of wisdom, lack of ability, lack of understanding and strength, that... Uh, my inability to deal with things I thought I could deal with. Uh, because of all of that, uh, he says, uh, I, I know I need something more than just being lifted out of the stuff that's about to take my life right now. I need more than that. And he says, first of all, as we've already spoken, hear me, Lord, I know who you are, what you are, how you work. I'm familiar with your loving kindness, etc., and then he says, Now turn me according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Lord, I'm at a crossroads, maybe three or four crossroads. I don't know which way to go. I don't know what to do now. I don't even know how to pray, Lord. I just want you to know, Father, that I come to you. And, and Lord, you said that as I come to the Father, I come to you. And I have to come to you to come to the Father. And, and so, Lord, I come to you and, and I ask you to turn me, guide me. Uh, not only lift my feet out of the miry clay that I'm stuck in, but when they're out, uh, set me on the right path. Turn me this way or that way. Uh, cause me to take a different road than what I've been following because the one I've been following is not altogether productive. And so he says, do it according to the multitude of your tender mercies. So what uh, does this all add up to? Probably David had prayed prayers similar to this in the past, got along fine for a while, and then found himself entrenched in trouble once again. And as a result of that, he's saying, 
I know you've talked to me, you've guided me, you've come to my rescue, you've protected me, you've ministered to me, you've been close to me, you've loved me. Many, many times I know that, Lord, but but your, your uh, outreach and your love and uh, the, the things that you do for your people are not limited and they're, they're unlimited totally and no matter how many times you've helped me before, Lord, I need your help now. Now, it's good to look back and know that God helped you before and realize it and remember how he helped you. And somehow or another, though this does not particularly speak to it, I think David remembered the grace, the mercy, and the deliverances of Almighty God in every step of his life up to this point. And this is not the David that with great boldness in the name of the Lord went to the brook and took the stones and slung them and captured and killed and destroyed uh, Goliath the giant. And so uh, this is a David who says, hey, uh, that was a great thing, but you did that, Lord. And, and uh, uh, this was a wonderful situation, but you did that, Lord. But now, Lord, uh, I'm, I'm in trouble again. I, I failed again. I've fallen short. Uh, and, uh, and, Father, I know what you did for me in the past. Uh, and I know, Lord, that some people would say, well, uh, you're going to run your, your cup of opportunity empty and dry if you keep messing around and calling on God and don't, don't get uh, everything straight to, when he helps you. And no, David says, I know better than that. I want you to turn me to the multitude of your tender mercies. Now, verse 17. Do not hide your face from your servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speedily. Now, uh, you've heard me say, and I've taught it uh, many times, uh, uh, that sometimes uh, God does not answer our prayer immediately, but he will answer it as time goes by. David is no doubt aware of that, but he declares to the Lord, uh, I, I know that, uh, uh, but uh, I also know that your tender mercies are such uh, uh, that uh, uh, you will still grant love and mercy to me as I call upon your name. I've had people say to me, you know, you know, Pastor, uh, I served the Lord for a while, and, and, I, and I really loved that. That was a wonderful thing. I enjoyed uh, the relationship that I had with the Lord and the presence of His Spirit, and I just felt like that, uh, my life was clean and pure and everything was just so wonderful. And then, you know, I committed a terrible sin. I fell away from God. And I know that I did something that God cannot forgive. And I just, I can't come back because I, I know God won't have me back. Oh, yes, He will. There's only one sin that uh, uh, keeps you from allowing God or, or asking God to uh, ever forgive you, and that's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And I'm not going to go into teaching to that, but I can tell you that uh, a very few percentage of those uh, uh, who have served the Lord and are aware of that unforgivable sin have ever committed it. Now, I've had a lot of people who think they have because the old devil tells them, well, God can't do anything for you. Look what you did. He can't forgive that. David knew better. David did just about everything, not quite, but just about everything that was a deep-seated, sinful act. And we need to remember that when he realized how Far he was from the obedient uh, person that he wanted to be in the kingdom of God, that he called out on God and asked God for help. And here he says, Lord, I'm in deep trouble. I want to tell you something. Don't let your pride or your arrogance or, or your embarrassment ever hinder you from saying to God, Lord, I am in deep trouble. I am in trouble. It's going to consume me. And God, I need a quick answer. Lord, I need a quick answer. 
I need deliverance. I need help. I confess that I'm sinking. I'm dying. I'm scared. I'm going to be destroyed. I don't want to go to the grave yet. I feel like I'm in such trouble that it's overwhelming me. And I need your help. And you'll discover that whether you find the full answer and deliverance from that thing that's pressing in upon you, you're going to find that God instills within you the strength, the ability, the confidence, uh, the, uh, what could I say, the, the uh, hanging on for dear life attitude uh, that causes you to walk in the strength of the Lord and in a, instead of the strength of yourself. So, there it goes. Now, verse 18. Draw near to my soul and redeem it. Deliver me because of my enemies. Don't deliver me because of my righteousness. I don't have any. Redeem me, Lord, because I'm impure and unclean and unwholesome. I'm, I, I'm not serving you as I should. And there's a lot of you out there that may hear this that started out on fire for God. By that I mean you had a zeal and a, and a beautiful anxiety and excitement about serving the Lord. And you did for some period of time. And then things came against you and things happened and your excitement for God dulled and you got preoccupied with the things and characteristics of this world. And... Uh, you slipped into that place where you didn't even feel God's presence anymore. Uh, you might have even tried to pray, and as you prayed, it seemed like that uh, the ceiling was brass, and everything you prayed dropped right back down in your face and just hung there. And you felt helpless and hopeless. And so David must have been feeling some of that. Because what he's saying is, uh, I know that there's nothing in me that can exercise your grace and your mercy and your loving kindness but I do know Lord that you can buy me back redeem me from the grip and the hold that sin and ungodliness and maybe just a dullness of thought and mind and indifference to the things of God bring us into David said it well. Draw near to my soul and redeem it. Restore it. Uh, bring it back to life. Uh, cause it to come into a position where the powers of darkness have no hold on it anymore. I want to feel your presence, to know your presence. I want the warmth of your love and your fellowship. I want it all, Lord, and so draw near to my soul. And he knew that uh, the old carnal flesh has a difficult time accepting the things of God because its nature is anti-God, anti-Christ. It's corrupt and uh, it's corruptible. And But the soul... That part of us that is eternal that God breathed into us when he brought life into Adam that he had formed from the dust of the earth. That living soul has become stagnant and there's no life in it anymore and it's, it's dull and ineffective and, and uh, it, it, it needs something to fill it and to bring it back to life and to renew it. And David is saying, draw near to my soul. Deal with me in my inner being, my soul, my spirit, the life that is really me. Deal with that, Lord. Minister to that, Lord, and redeem it, restore it, put it back into the position and condition that it needs to be in order to have perfect fellowship with you. And so we find David crying out again without embarrassment or fear, Draw near to my soul and redeem it. Deliver me because of my enemies. Don't let my enemies win and gloat over my destruction. He's crying out unto the Lord. Lord, let them know that you are able to intervene and salvage even such as I am and have been. 
And David recognized that. Now, verse 19 says, You know my reproach, my shame, my dishonor. My adversaries are all before you. Well, what's he saying? He's saying, Lord, if you haven't seen it yourself, my adversaries are standing before your throne, pointing their finger and saying, look at what David did. Look at what David is. Look how David lives. Look what David didn't do. Look what David should have done. Look what David is. Look how David functions. See, he's not worthy of your love, of your uh, redemption. He's not worthy of anything, Lord. Let him go. We want to destroy him. And so David is saying, you already know who my adversaries are and what they're doing. They're standing before your throne all the time, uh, railing against me and pointing out all of my failures and my shortcomings and, and my sin and my ungodliness and, that the old human flesh uh, has uh, incarcerated uh, uh, within me. And uh, he's saying, uh, I need your help. You know my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. He's not saying, Lord, uh, I'm not really that bad. You know I made a mistake and I'm sorry. So, uh, just Lord, just pass over it and forget it. Uh, Lord, I want to serve you anyway. No, David said, I'm not worthy. I know my dishonor. I know my sin. I know my ungodliness. I know my shame, my shameful, shameful activity and, and uh, lifestyle. I know, and I know that you know, Lord, but... I want you to know that I know that you know very well if it wasn't called to your attention, which you don't have to have anything called to your attention, Lord, but if it wasn't, uh, I know that you know because look at all of them. They're circling me about and pointing my, their finger at me and saying, look at him, God, look at him. Well, isn't that just exactly what you feel when you failed God, when you've made a mistake in the flesh? When you've allowed yourself to slip into some activity or attitude that you know is not of God. When you've committed some sin that you never intended or wanted to do, but you did. And so, there you are. And now you know that you stand before God naked, nothing hidden from Him. And there you are, seeking help from Almighty God. Well, what do I do about that? Well, you can say, Lord, I, I know that wasn't really as bad as it may seem. Uh, just forget it, Lord, and I won't do it again. But you will. And so what happens? David said, I need a change in my life. I know my reproach, and I know what my adversaries are doing. And so now verse 20 says, reproach has broken my heart. I'm a broken man, Father. I've shed tears, I've struggled within, my spirit is dominated with discouragement and, and reproach and, and humiliation and embarrassment and, and failure has overwhelmed me. I know that, Father. Uh, my, my heart is broken because of my reproach and I am full of heaviness. Uh, going to back to my remarks just a moment ago, that it's a popular thing in the world today when someone is guilty of some uh, uh, malpractice or sinful activity, uh, they often point their finger and say, well, it's their fault. I wouldn't have done this if it wasn't for them. Uh, they led me into it. Uh, they caused me to do it. Well, they're the ones that caused my anger to rise and I acted in anger and committed sin. Uh, no. That's not the way it works with God. David knew how it worked. He said, you know my shame and my reproach and my dishonor, and you know that I know it, and I know that you know it because look what's going on around me. I'm not ignorant to their finger pointing and their uh, reproach and contempt that they have for me. And so, verse 20, he says, it's gone to the point that it's broken my heart. I'm a broken man. I've come to the place where I feel helpless and incapable of making any uh, resurgence and, and renewal into fellowship with you, Lord. I, I, I'm full of heaviness of heart and spirit. I looked for someone to take pity, 
But there was none. No one cared. And you know there's an old saying that we have, well, you soon learn who your friends are when you're in trouble. If you're in trouble, those who claim to be your friends suddenly disappear. Uh, they just sort of evaporate into the thin air. Never hear from them anymore, never talk to them anymore, and don't have any concern for you. They just dissipate out into the wilderness, I guess. And so what? I looked for someone that would take pity, someone that would comfort me, would help me, would encourage me. There wasn't anyone. And for comforters, but I found none. There was nobody that said, David, you can't undo what you've done, but you can change from here on out. God does love you. God will help you. God uh, is the source of your strength. Uh, be encouraged because you'll get through this with the help of the Lord. None of that, David said, could he find. And then he says, not only that, but they also gave me gall for my food. That's bitter, bitter, bitter uh, drink. And for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. Uh, food can be bitter too. It can be uh, so distasteful that you cannot eat it. And so uh, he says, they gave me gall for my food. And for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. It's time for me to close this lesson now. And... Uh, uh, we're going to receive communion right after we listen to this gospel song. Mercy. It's joy and it's song Till grace placed me right Where I belong When mercy rewrote my life Mercy
praise the Lord. I hope you realize that it's our own actions that separate us from God. Uh, God does not separate himself from us. We separate ourselves from him. And one of the things that a lot of people neglect to do is to receive communion and take communion with the attitude and the knowledge of what it really means and represents. Now the Apostle Paul was giving instruction to the church at Corinth, which had become somewhat um, lax in its worship and fellowship with God. Uh, they had fallen into the characteristics and habits and nature of the old carnal flesh, and their a commitment unto the Lord Jesus Christ and the Heavenly Father in pure, upright living had waned to the point that they had even violated uh, communion as it was intended to be extended to them. And so I'm going to read to you from chapter 11, 1 Corinthians, and we'll begin reading with verse number 23. Sort of tells its own story as we begin to read. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take this and eat it. It's my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Acknowledge, reveal, express your understanding of the Lord's death until, what? Until he come. Verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. That means many die, or are dead. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. And so with that, we have the instruction of how to receive it, what attitude to come before the Lord, what we are to acknowledge in receiving communion, and with understanding and awareness that it represents the uh, sacrificial offering that was made for us by Jesus Christ at the whipping post of uh, the terrible uh, trip up Golgotha's Hill and then nailing to the cross and being crucified because he was pure and righteous, and the scripture says he became our sin as he hung upon the cross. Now, I can't imagine the grief that that would bring and the heartache that that would bring. Uh, when I think of my sin, I, I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to bear it. I, I have to say, Lord, that's cleansed. That's gone. It's forgiven. You've purged me. You've made me clean. And, and I don't have to deal with it. But can you imagine the Lord taking on the guilt and the condemnation that the actions and the sinful nature of this old flesh produced down through the centuries of, and that he paid it all that we might have life eternal? Think about that. And so it is. Now as we dwell upon it and we're aware that we, we are blessed people, we are surely uh, thankful for the privilege of receiving communion and remembering that God loved us enough to send His only begotten Son to offer Himself on the cross of Calvary for us. Let's take of the bread. Now I'm going to pray that we bless God bless the bread. I'm going to pray that if there's any uncleanness in us, that God will forgive us. And if you have any uncleanness in you, ask God to cleanse you before you eat of the bread. And I think that if we understand that, that uh, you'll be blessed and uh, we can eat of it with, with thanksgiving and excitement because of what it represents. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being... Uh, uh, the one that paid the price for us, 
Jesus Christ, our Lord and King, Redeemer. Lord, the price that you paid, we cannot even imagine. And yet, Lord, we know that it was for us. And so, if there's any uncleanness within us, if we blemish the righteousness of your garments that you uh, put upon us and within us and around us upon our conversion, Lord, uh, uh, purify us again and cleanse us anew, we pray, in Jesus' name, as we eat of this bread. We're reminded, Lord, that it says that even our infirmities and sicknesses were paid for healing uh, as you paid the price in your own body for us. And so now, Lord, let those who are ill and sick uh, have disease be made whole, even as we partake of the bread that represents your broken body. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us eat together. Now you'll remember that the scripture said in like manner, he took the cup, he held it up, and he said, as you drink this cup, it is to bring remembrance to the blood that I shed for you on the cross of Calvary. And we need to remember that it represents that we were redeemed from the damnation and judgment of eternal death. And instead, because of the shedding of His blood in our behalf, we have become new creation, new creatures in Jesus Christ upon our conversion. And so we acknowledge with thanksgiving and praise. A heavy heart because of the terrible price that He paid, but oh, the joy and the victory and the rejoicing, the excitement about the future, the eternal hope of everlasting life in the presence of our Lord and kingdom, and uh, we just give God glory because we have the privilege of drinking this cup in remembrance of his shed blood. Let us drink together in the name of Jesus. Let us drink. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father. And for those of you who want to draw really close to the Lord, I pray that there's something that was said in the lesson today that will inspire you, encourage you, and help you to say, Come close to me, Lord, and touch me in my soul. Praise His name. Thank you for listening to Christian Living 101. Remember, we are totally dependent upon your prayers and generosity. Log on to ChristianLiving101.org. There are over 300 video Bible studies there, plus many other items of interest with Pastor Applegate. We welcome your prayer requests and your questions. Please contact us at ChristianLiving101. That's P.O. Box 72150 in Phoenix, Arizona, 85050. Or email Gene at gene, with a G-E-N-E, gene, at christianliving101.org. That's P.O. Box 72150 in Phoenix, Arizona, 85050. Or email gene, at gene, with a G-E-N-E, gene, at christianliving101.org.